We're in this restaurant. She is a server in this restaurant. Okay. She sees me, drops her tray, hugs me, and says she was considering committing suicide that day. Me praying for her led her to relationship. And that saved her life. I will never forget that, man. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the High Critique Podcast. It's a podcast that goes beyond the classroom, beyond the lesson plans, and focuses on the teacher, or in this case, the superintendent, as a person. <laughs> I'm your host, Joel Nieto, and joining me today is a very, very special guest. He's been called the Bo Jackson of administrative leadership. <laughs> he is a really? former teacher, a prior principal. You ever heard that before? No, I haven't heard that. You serious? Yeah, so he, every, everyone calls you that. No, I, I, something I made up. I was going to say, man, I, I, I heard that. He's a former teacher, a prior principal, and an NFL alum. He is the recent leader of Community ISD and the current superintendent of LCISD. He is the one. He is the only. He is the unstoppable Dr. Roosevelt Nivens. How are you, Thank sir? Thank you, sir. Good. Thank you for the introduction, man. All right. The Bo Jackson I, I, of, uh, of, of uh, administrative leadership is something I came up with. Man, I need to put you on the payroll, man. All right, man, because you've I'm done it all. You I, know? Like it. I like so, it. I like So, I mean, you're the two-time superintendent. I mean, most people work their entire lives to get to the one time. You know what I'm saying? And I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. So, what's it like to be you uh, these days? <laughs> it's, not all, it's not all it's cracked up to be. It's not. Uh, I am... Uh, Man, I'm just I'm just a kid from Oklahoma, man. Grew up on a farm in the country. Okay. And uh, uh, parents gave me some some values and uh, taught me how to live and taught me how to treat people. Okay. And really instilled in me do that and don't disappoint us. Don't mess up our name. And that was really it, man. I mean, you know. So. Well, how, how much more do you really need? You know. That's all you need, man. You know, life's not that hard. Your life's pretty <laughs> simple. You know. You know. You don't need a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. I had two. Parents, my mom's in heaven, but my dad is still here, and uh, he's the best man I know. Nice. And he taught me how to be a man, and I saw him how to be a great husband and a great father. And okay. I'm just trying to live up, you know, because I have his name. Yeah. So I'm trying to live up to oh, his name. Oh, you're a junior. I'm a junior. Oh, okay. I'm a junior, so I'm trying to live up to his name. He tells me all the time. He says, "Son, don't don't get to Houston and mess up my name." All right, all right, pops. <laughs> so that's pressure. This. Yeah, he put yeah, pressure that, on. That's me. the audience member we got to be we got to be talking to. Yeah, he along put pressure with a on. Others. So. Yeah. Let me ask you this question then. Uh, well, let's let's get started with this. The, the first time I, I laid eyes on you was uh, at the Seaborn meet and greet, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, obviously, I saw you from uh, a mile away because you're, you're so. How, how tall are you? you know, six man. five. Six five. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm hard to miss, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw I'm you. I was like, miss. wow. Okay. He definitely has a presence, but you know what struck me more than your physical presence was uh, how you how you carried yourself on the microphone. And, uh, you know, you got up there, you said a few words. And um, I don't know, it, it struck a chord with me. I, fe I felt like I wanted, um, I wanted you on the podcast regardless. Yes, sir. But at that moment, I want, what I wanted most, I kind of, I switched my vision in, from, you know, interviewing the superintendent to giving the man that I saw on the microphone a spotlight uh, to, sh to show that side of you because you know, as you know, you're taking over for um, a doctor, legend. A legend, right? Yes, sir. A yeah, they got legend. schools yes, sir. named after him. Yes, sir. The one and the only Dr. Yes, Thomas sir. Randall. And um, those are big shoes to fill. Yeah. But I, I um, if if you're half the man that I that I met that day, I feel like we're in good hands. Oh yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead. Let's dive right in. Um, okay. The way the Hyper Teach podcast works is. You know, we talked about who you are. You told me, you know, your background, Oklahoma. Do um, you have any brothers and sisters, by the way? I have two older brothers. So I'm the youngest. Oh, OK. Oh, the wow. Youngest. The youngest got the junior, huh? I'm the youngest. Yes. So when I was born, my two brothers, my dad said they don't look like me. Oh. And so my dad and I, so my two brothers have, they have more on my mom's side. So they're, gotcha, they're gotcha. smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad's a big dude. And so when I was born, <laughs> I came out the right complexion, the right facial features, okay. uh, the pink lip. <laughs> and uh, he said, that's, that's me. That's so, the junior I've been waiting yes, for. Yes, sir. So he named me Roosevelt Nivis Jr. Nice. All right, man. Well, um, let, let's rewind the clock all the way back. And uh, about when did the, um, first of all, what kind of, what kind of kid were you in, in school? Uh, I struggled academically, man. I, I struggled oh, okay. hard. I struggled severely. Um, 
I uh, had very low self esteem as a kid in mm -hmm. school. In school, okay, uh, because I was not successful academically, and so uh, uh, my parents were both educators, mm -hmm. and so my dad did it forty nine years, forty eight, forty nine years. You know, you lose count, right? Uh, my mom did it forty years, and uh, they were busy helping other people's kids. Yeah. And so, oh, when, so both parents were, were teachers. Both my, yeah, wow. both my parents. That's why I became a teacher. Mm. Um, and so they were helping other people's kids, and I wasn't planned. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm 12 years younger than my oldest brother, and like 10 years younger than my middle brother. Oh wow! So hey, everybody loves surprises. You know, you know, and they say the best <laughs> for last. They say the best for last. Um, and so they were busy helping other people's kids. Okay. And uh, I struggled academically, and they didn't know it. And uh, I couldn't read, couldn't write, man, couldn't spell my name. Uh, and I never forget, I had a teacher in fourth grade, and uh, I, I'm okay because normally when I tell this story, I get emotional. Mm. Um, but I think I'm okay. I'm thinking I'm okay. We'll see. Uh, I had a teacher in fourth grade uh, that would intentionally make me get up and read it from the class, um, and then she, along with the students, would laugh at me because I couldn't read. Oh, damn. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I still remember that to this day. I still remember how that felt. Uh, and I started questioning, you know, why am I even here? Uh, why am I even on this earth? Like, what's my purpose? Oh, so I just, why am I here in the front of the class? Why are you here on this mortal coil? Period. Okay. Period. Like, you know, I, I, I don't offer nothing. Yeah. And I see my dad, who is uh, a, a very well-respected coach in Oklahoma. Uh, everybody loves him. Everybody, my mom's a high school teacher, loves her. And I see all these accolades they're getting, and I'm like, you know, I'm there's no way in the world I'm gonna live up to that. Wow. Uh, and so she would have me in front of class and laugh at me with the other kids. And there was another kid named Michael, mm -hmm. and uh, so Michael and I were brothers from different mothers, you know. So I was a little short, fat black kid. He was a short, fat white kid, <laughs> and uh, we would share Twinkies at lunch, right? Yeah, and nice. so, uh, but when she would get that's me how you to, know you're close. Yeah, yeah. You know, you share food. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't give them up uh, easy. Those Twinkies. And so. She would call me up to the front to read, and somehow he would make his way to the front, and then he would whisper the words to me while I was trying to read. And so, uh, anyway, I let it go. You still, you, you still keep in touch with Michael? No, I don't. I don't. We left Oklahoma and uh, hadn't talked to him. Oh, man. I need yeah. to give him a shout out. Yeah. But I'm going to let that go because I get emotional. All but right, yeah, right. that was, that was, uh, you want to call that was powerful. This this no, I don't. I don't. Okay, good. I don't. All right. Don't. That's what I'm <laughs> man. All right. So. Uh, so for how, okay, so from traumatic experiences in the classroom, uh, I'm sure that, I mean, as you and I both know, that that stuff plays a, a part, man. It and, and you cannot downplay the role of a teacher and the influence in yes, a kid's sir. life. That's the power of a teacher. So right now, you seem like a big, confident man. So how do we transition from a kid who's low self-esteem, questions his place on this on this mortal coil, uh, uh, you know, being alive? To and and I, f I feel like that would make you resentful to, to education to begin with. Now you're leading. This is your second district. You're leading. Yeah. Well, that 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 defined my purpose. Okay. Um, I want to be a voice for all children. All right. Uh, especially the ones that don't have a voice at home. Mm. Especially the ones who are struggling with just life in general. Okay. Um, and make sure that a, I have a school system that meets the needs of all kids, no matter where they come from, what they look like. What they do, what their parents do, it doesn't matter. If that child walks into a building and I'm the superintendent of that school district, mm. that kid's needs will be met. Nice. Bottom line. All right, so let's transition from this. You, um, you start there, you eventually grow. At, at what point, well, first off, how, how bad, I mean, feeling like you don't belong is pretty bad. It was bad. But uh, how did that affect your behavior in class? And or was it only just grades or? No, it was just grades. Uh, and they, they passed me along because everybody loved my dad. Gotcha. And so I was that kid that uh, my dad was a superstar. I mean, he, I say he's the best man I know. I, I don't know any man better than him. So he was a superstar educator. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the teachers have said, well, you know, that's, that's Nivis' kid. I mean, he's, he won't cause you no trouble mm -hmm. because my dad said, boy, don't let them people call me about you. Mm. You know, so you know what that means. I right? do. I, you know what I, that means. I was I, I come from a single parent home yeah. with my mom, so and uh, she used to be the music director yeah. at church. And so uh, when she's in the front of the church, I was in the front of the church, mm -hmm. and I better not act up. That's so right. There was a lot of this. 
That's right. <laughs> so you never yell, never raise a voice. That's right. Snap That's the right. finger. And the That's right. The finger. So, That's right. All right. So. So, yeah, my behavior, I was not a bad kid. I was very compliant and very respectful okay, because I, I did you. not want to answer to him. All right. I did not want to answer to him or my mother. So, yeah, I wasn't going to do that. So, where, where does the transformation take place? I mean, I know that's your purpose. Did it happen after the, the, out of the education system, or did you encounter a teacher who eventually made an impact on you? I encountered a teacher, um, and she literally, like, put me on a whole different path. Okay. Just by, not because she was a great teacher, but because she spoke life to me every okay. single day. And McKinney. Okay. Spoke life to me every single day. And every time I walked in her class, man, she loved on me and hugged on me. And for some reason, man, I don't know why, mm -hmm. she just... Took a liking to Yeah, me. you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then I was like, I don't even deserve that kind of... But yeah, it was her, man. She she did it. What grade is this? Six. Sixth grade. All right. Yeah, six. And was that enough to turn the thing around? That was enough to, to get me to start doing... Uh, to have some more confidence, mm. and then uh, I started playing football. Oh yeah, okay. I started yeah, sixth playing grade, football. Then go seventh grade. That's when we got we get sports. In your yeah, life. started playing football. Okay, uh, and was halfway decent, and then realized that I uh, I had something to offer, and I also realized that because I could play football decently at this point, okay, people listened to me. And people, you know, you know, ask my opinion and what I thought about stuff, you know. I oh, said, so this oh. is your first introduction to like leadership. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm in middle school at this point, and mm. people are like, you know, so you know what, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And uh, more people are talking to me, and I'm I'm just kind of listening, and I'm still thinking about what my parents are teaching me about uh, treating people right, and being a good person, and being kind, and being gentle. Uh, and the more I did that, the more people gravitated to me. Uh, and then I got better in football, and then that kind of just grew of people just uh, uh, admiring my leadership style. Wow. You know, and then my personality became contagious. After I came out of my shell, okay. then, you know, I really, I really found that I, I like people. All right. Yeah. So, you got, so now we're in football. You've got this new found superpower of leading people, <laughs> basically. Uh, you graduate, uh, how, you know, you chose a college. I remember you said something uh, the day that I met you, or on, on the speech, you said, mm -hmm. you chose the place because it was the furthest place away from where you were. That's right. It was the furthest place. So I had offers, so we were in Austin at this point. Uh, went to Austin High School in Austin. My dad was a coach there also. And so when he retired, they named the gym after him. I mean, this dude is legendary, man. He sounds like it. Uh, yeah, he's legendary. Uh, but anyway, so I chose Liberty University in Virginia because that was the furthest place to offer me a football scholarship. Wow. Because I had to get away from home. I needed to I needed to go and grow up and just, you know. And my parents prepared us for that. They, they raised us to be independent young people. So the dream of the so, NFL uh, hits high school, starts to get realized in college. What, what age do... Uh, does that, that, that part of the, the story kick off? Yeah, so uh, high school still, you know, I hadn't reached my potential. Okay. Um, you weren't wrecking pools. No, 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 no. Not not every play. Were you defense or offense? I know you're lying. I was defensive line in high school. Oh. And uh, love defensive line, love okay. Reggie White. I don't know if you know who Reggie White is. You might be too young to know who that is. I've, I've heard the name, uh, but I, I, I don't. They call I, him the Minister of Defense. He played for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Green Bay Packers toward the end. Okay, okay. Uh, he was a preacher, and he he wrecked havoc on the field. He was and he was a preacher, and so he you know he slammed me down and say you know in the name of Jesus that yeah, kind of right. stuff you know. Uh, but I loved watching him. He and, slammed uh, people in the spirit. He I was uh, he was uh, he was a force to be reckoned with. So anyway, okay, okay. I really liked how he played, okay. and so I played. Uh, but when I got to college, yeah. uh, the coach bamboozled me and said, "Really, Nivens? Really, you're an offensive lineman." Uh, you got these long arms, you know, okay. you got this, you know, you got quick feet. Uh, you know, I ran a 4.8 in college. Okay. And so uh, a 4 eight forty in college for a big dude is pretty fast. Okay. For people that don't know. Uh, <laughs> pretty fast. All right. Uh, so anyway, he switched me off to the line and was much better at it and fell in love with it. Wow, okay. And then started getting recognition from scouts, uh, people coming to games to watch me play. Okay. Um, being become just becoming known, making an all conference team, wow. name in magazines, that's all the alignment. So, you know, wow. it was it was a big deal. Um, so anyway. 
So, so you're no stranger to the spotlight then. Because I feel no. like, okay, because like one of the things, like I was usually when I do the podcast, I'm in like jeans, mm -hmm. I'm in baseball cap, hoodie, whatever. I knew you were going to be in a suit, but I was like, I, you know, I don't want to make him feel like he has to. But then my friend, cameraman, he's having, he's a teacher as well. Okay. So he's doing, uh, his kids were graduating today. So I couldn't be the only one not in the suit. Yeah. And it's it's hot in Texas, dude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So well, you got three pieces on, man. I got three, I got the three yeah, pieces. Yeah, you, know you got saying? three pieces on. Yeah, so, you, you, you're killing it. Thank you so much, man. I'm digging it. So, it, you know, how, like, did any of that prepare you for, for where you are now? All these meet and greets, all these, you know what I'm saying? Because some yeah. people, they, they die from the spotlight, you know? Yeah. They melt. Yeah. No, I'm okay. You I'm know. okay. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm very comfortable with who I am. Okay. I'm extremely comfortable being, being a big dude. I don't mind, <laughs> you know, I don't mind going to a place and a chair is too small. I don't mind saying, yeah, yeah I know I can't fit in that. Okay. I'm cool, you know. Okay, and so yeah. there are a lot of people who are not. Okay. And so if you're not comfortable in your skin, then do something about it. I feel you. Uh, but I am. <laughs> and so, uh, but yeah, even growing up, you know, my parents always had us in church, in front of the church, reciting speeches and talking. Can you and sing? No, not even a little bit. <laughs> Uh, my wife. So no, you weren't in the choir. You just recited. I was in the choir, oh, okay. uh, but you know, I didn't sing too. I mean, I can't sing. I'm I'm horrible. Right. Uh, but my wife can sing very well. Oh, nice. She's, she sings well. You know, she's traveled the world singing. Um, and so, uh, but no, I, I can't sing a lick. So anyway, <laughs> my parents putting always putting us in the spotlight at church, yeah. making us talk, making us speak up, making us have a firm handshake, look people in the eye when you talk to them, son. That's the kind of stuff my dad would teach me. Uh, Nobody wants a weak man, son. You know, be be strong, work hard, be kind, be gentle. You know, all that stuff that a boy needs to hear from his dad. And so I was very fortunate and blessed to be able to have him. And he's still here. He's still on this earth. And so uh, he just turned 82 and he's still the best man I know. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so obviously you're not in the NFL now. Uh, I, I assume, I, I think, I heard you say you, you suffered an injury? Yeah, so I went to the Canadian Football League first. Okay. And so uh, it was a year, a couple years in there, uh, the Canadian League had American teams. Mm -hmm. So it's the Baltimore Stallions. Okay. That's where I was. Was in camp, got hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they say, you know, you're no more good. You know, I mean, you're playing football. Yeah. You're no know, you know more good. So then I just kind of traveled around. I ended up in Dallas and uh, got to Dallas. Couldn't pass the physical. And the guy looked at me and said, son, yo, you, you, you're done. Your career is done. Um, and the How old reason, are you at this time? 22, 23. Wow. Um, several, several things happened. Now, hindsight is 2020, of course. Yeah. Uh, one was I was too young and stupid to go to the trainer and take care of my body. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought I was invincible. You know, I, I'll rejuvenate. You know, I'm young. I'm good. Mistake number one. Okay. Mistake number two was uh, football took the place of the God I was supposed to serve. Football became uh -huh. my God. I mean, I, I loved it. I loved practice. I loved film. I loved the workout. Er, man, everything about it, I loved it. And that was me. And then it was taken from me. Uh, I think it was taken from me because it, it was, was the wrong. It was an idol. I feel you, man. Yeah. And, and it's funny how he does that, dude. And, and in the moment, sometimes one of the things that we put on the pedestal most, and mm -hmm. I'm sure... I have, I've had it, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm sure people watching, that thing is taken away. If your identity is caught up in that, yeah. it's hard to find a, yeah. a different path. Yeah. So how, um, I know you, you got secure, you were a leader, the NFL was a dream. Um, did you ever wrap your identity in that? And how hard was it to come to grips with the doctor saying your career is over? Yeah, it was difficult. It was difficult. Uh, so I had a chance to leave early, actually, to leave college early. Okay. Uh, and so the Buffalo Bills were calling um, and spoke to my dad and like called my pastor, like my youth pastor. It was it was pretty deep. And my dad was like, no, you need to graduate. Smart. You got to graduate. Smart. And he said, son, you know, we're educators and education is what we do. So you got to graduate. And so uh, I didn't really appreciate that too much. Uh, but I stayed because, you know, he's the best man I know. <laughs> and so I was very obedient. And I stayed and then my career was over just like that. And so when I called him, I was here in Dallas, and I said, man, you know, my, my career is over, man. I'm done. And he said, well, you can't come home, but you, you're a certified teacher. Go to work. Yo. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> it wasn't any sympathy. It wasn't like, oh, son, I'm so sorry, man. It wasn't none of that. He said, well, first you can't come home. 
because me and your mama now, you know, we empty nesters. You can't come home. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you're a certified teacher. What I heard him say was, I told you to get that degree. Yeah. And, I, and see, now you need it. Yeah. That's what I heard him say. Yeah. He didn't say that, but that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I started teaching and coaching in Dallas. Wow. Okay, so you're teaching coach in Dallas. Um, do you ever make it into the classroom? Uh, make it into the classroom? Yeah, yeah. Were you ever a core subject teacher? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> funny story. So my principal, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Georgetta Johnson, who I love dearly, she's the, she actually pushed me into becoming an administrator. Okay. She's um, still alive? Uh, yes, and oh. she lives here in Houston. Oh, nice. Uh, she would come to me before class, before school started, and she would say, "Coach, I need you to teach Algebra One." Okay. Now I'm not Algebra. I'm not, I don't know Algebra. Okay. And my comment was, "You got it, Doc. Let's nice. roll with it." Yeah. I mean, that's that. I think that's the attitude we should have. Of course. Yeah. You know, you have to be willing. That's right. And so when the principal comes and says, "I, I need you," that that says a lot. Oh yeah. You got it, Doc. I'm good. Let's let's roll with it. In my head, I'm like, girl, you know I can't teach no algebra. <laughs> but you know, she's not gonna hear me say that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I did algebra, well, let them see you sweat. world geography, and biology. I taught all high school. I did all of those in high school. Um, and was and was good at it, mm -hmm. and was good at it. I mean, you know, I, I like kids. Okay. And I think, you know, kids can smell blood, and kids can smell fear. Yeah. Um, and kids know if you don't care about them. And so when the kids walked in my room, now I was in, South Dallas, um, which is urban side, low income side of town. Okay. And then I was in South Oak Cliff, which is the same in South Dallas. And so uh, when those students walked into my room, hadn't eaten, you know, mom and dad got into an argument or dad is not around mm -hmm. or somebody got shot last night, you know, all that yeah, kind yeah, of stuff, yeah, you know, gang related dope, all that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Um, and they walked in my room, man, and it was like, they just love being with Coach Nivens. Yeah. Uh, and it was so funny because my wife said when she and I were dating and I had I was coaching football, she said the lineman actually started to walk like me. <laughs> you know, because I would hang with him. Like before I took him home, uh, every day after practice, yeah. I fed him. You know, we had like a Williams chicken across the street. Yeah. I would send somebody with some money. I said, man, go get 30 pieces of chicken. And I'm feeding my linemen before they go home, you know. And so, uh, man, I fell in love with them boys, you know. Yeah, I, so, um, I, I, when my, I remember my first few years here at Navarro, you find, yeah, people are attracted to just mm -hmm. being around certain people, you know. And uh, I, I, I'll say to you what my friend uh, Chesley uh, said to me. I was like, you know, I was, I was confused by it at first, you know. Mm -hmm. And he just told me, he's like, well, you, I was like, man, why, why do you think these kids are attracted to certain teachers, you know? And he's like, oh, don't, don't be surprised. They're, they're attracted to the Jesus in you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that's probably what it is. Yeah. You know, and they, yeah. they see that that leadership, that that peace, especially if it's an alternative to whatever they're else they're going through. Right, right. So um, yeah, man, for sure. Yeah. So teacher, so you know, coach and teacher, multiple different subjects. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? So I I, I, I really just wanted to be a head football coach. Oh, okay. Uh, Cause I still have football in my blood, so I say, you know, and I was really good at coaching off the line, the big boys. That's all I care about, the big boys. And so uh, I was really good at it, and I was able to help some kids really overcome obstacles in life uh -huh. and in the classroom because I was their coach. And so I could mentor them and speak life into them and help them, you know. And I spent a lot of time with them. We don't, we don't, you don't realize how much time kids spend with their coaches. That's why you got to have high quality coaches. Okay. They'll spend more time with the coach than they do their own parents. Wow. You know, you think about it, coaches in school out with them all day, mm -hmm. and then practice all night. They go home for a couple of hours and do it the next day in school and practice. Mm -hmm. Game night, they're with you till midnight or one o'clock. Yeah. Weekends is practice and film. So you got to have great men and women that are coaches. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? With high quality, with high, with high character, more high morals, yeah. and a strong character. Yes, sir. Um, so I would come home and I would complain to my wife and I would say, you know, I'm working with several coaches who are bad for kids. Uh, like they don't care, they don't show up, they cuss them out, they do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And, sh and finally she got sick of me complaining. She said, just go be a principal then, stop complaining about oh, it. And so man. she charged me up. Okay. And so uh, if you ever seen my wife, she's 4'11". Oh, yeah? She weighs 100 pounds. Wow. So she's a little bitty lady, you know, she's a fireball though. 
and I got mad. I was like, you charging me up, you know, you know and I will go be a principal then. Wow. And that's, that's how that ball started rolling. And then the same conversation, I became a principal, uh, turning around schools and high performing and all that kind of stuff. Nice. And, but I would see other principals not grinding for their kids. Yeah. And then I said it again to her. <laughs> I said, man, you know, our district, we could be a high performing district if this dude would do what this lady would do what that's yeah, supposed yeah. to go be a superintendent then. I said, you know what, you're right. And so, uh, you know, she's she's my she's my uh, she's my everything, man. I mean, she's yeah. she's why I am where I am okay. because of her challenging me to do more uh, and stop complaining. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, dude, a, a, good, a good woman, man. They, they make a difference. Yes, I, I actually just got married. I didn't realize. Congratulations. Yeah, I don't have my ring on, dude. I, I took it off while I was watching this morning. Oh, and I was in a rush. Man. You know, it was for you. I was trying to get all the. the no, nah, don't blame me. Uh uh. I'm not taking that. No, so, no, no. Mm -mm. All right, so yeah. I'm not taking that. So I'm, I'm covering it. I got, my, I got my ring on. <laughs> all right, so uh, yeah, but yeah, they're definitely a blessing. Um, all right, so your principal, how long does this last? How long? How many years are your principal? Ooh, ooh. Uh, 2005 to 11. Okay. Yeah, 2005 to 11. Wow. Um, same school? No, no. So I was in the same district for 12 years. Uh, every two years I got a promotion. Wow, look at you. So I was in a middle, I was a middle school AP for, a junior high AP for two years. Okay. Then went up to the high school for two years as an, as an AP back to the middle school as a principal, then back to the high school as a principal, and then to central office as a CNI, secondary CNI, it's curriculum and instruction. Oh. I oversaw secondary curriculum and instruction. Okay. And then the uh, superintendent put me in HR, and said, so I need you to take over HR. Every time it was Nivens go fix this, every time. And so, uh, and I landed and I finished in human resources. Then I became. Then I went to be a superintendent. Look at you, man. All right. So um, you know, I, I, I a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of people I really admire, are on that path of, of going in, of thinking about leaving the classroom, mm -hmm. transitioning into the assistant principal, the principal, you know, looking to get out of the classroom into leadership. Uh, what would be one piece of advice you would give anybody who is thinking about making that transition? Yeah, I have more than one piece of advice. So. Okay. Um, First, I would say mentally be where you are. Okay. Don't be in the classroom. Uh, in, don't be in the classroom one thinking one about being an assistant principal. I feel you. you know. Okay. The reason why I stopped coaching was because I realized in practice I, I met my wife. She was my girlfriend then, and I was on the field and I kept looking at my watch, ready to go. And I said, now I'm doing a disservice to my boys mm -hmm. because I'm not all in. I'm worried about her, so I need to do yeah. something different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got out of coaching because I wasn't fully committed to that anymore. And so first off, be fully committed where you are. Secondly, you gotta have some success behind your name. Nobody's gonna hire a leader and you're a poor performing teacher. You're always complaining. You're in the teacher's lounge griping. You're having grievances. You got low performance scores. You're getting written up all the time. You're late to work. You know what I mean? You gotta be a high performing individual. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what will make you a high performing leader. Think about it. If if I come to work late every day, I'm always complaining. I never do my lesson plans. My kids are not performing. I always get all these complaints. Then I become an assistant principal at the same campus or even in the same district. Okay. What do you think my peers are going to say when I become assistant principal about me? I, I can think of a few things. Man, how he get how that happen? <laughs> you know, he was yeah. never he. You know, they and they just start listening yeah. up all the stuff. You can't and, lead. And, if, and if then the system is a joke. Yeah. And then the system becomes a joke because they say, Yikes. well, yeah, they must not really value true leadership and true skill because I tried, I didn't get a job, but this dude, yeah. you know, so you, you got to have some success behind your name. All right. So then um, we'll, 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 we're almost to the present day. Mm -hmm. You've uh, you've worked your way through HR. You've made it to the uh, your first job in, uh, as a superintendent of a community ISD. Mm -hmm. Right. And then um, how long were you superintendent there? Six years. Six years. Wow, man. And um, who? How do you? How, how do you get the? How did you end up in LSISD? You know what I'm saying? Like, is there a call you made, or do you look up like where? <laughs> like, what, what's going on? Uh, so when I first Are went you to recruited? Central Office, like I was recruited. 
Okay. Uh, but when I went to Central Office in Lancaster, where I was, okay. in Dallas, uh, that superintendent then, Dr. McFarland, said, you know, we're a new team. We need to go see a high-performing superintendent and his team. Okay. And we came to Lamar CISD oh, in wow. 2010. Okay. And I'm new. I'm fresh off the campus. I'm new. And uh, I had known Dr. Randall because, you know, I, I was an assistant principal and I was calling him and listening to him speak at conferences and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Then I saw him work with his team yeah. and I was like, man, this dude is that gum. This dude is a rock star. Like just leadership and stories and just knowledge, just wisdom just oozes out of him. Yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> I said, then if Lamar ever came open, I would love to go there. Wow. And it, you know, that's why I say, if somebody ever came up, and I, I would love to go there, even okay. even to work under Dr. Randall. Okay. I was like, if the opportunity came, I would go there. And so. Uh, wow. Well, it must have made it. What exactly did he do that made an impact? Like I know you said you saw him and his his style. What what made that impact? To First off, uh, to have the resume that he has, and he's the president and was the president of all kinds of state and national organizations. Mm. You know, when you're the president of organizations, that means people, you know, have faith in your leadership. Okay. And when he's the president of a national superintendent's organization, that means superintendents from around the nation value his opinion. And this is a hard job. You know, we make it look easy. Man, it's hard. This job is stressful. On the inside, man, you, it's stressful. Okay. It's stressful. And so, uh, but to watch him do it with such poise, and he always made time for everybody. It's right here, yeah. I always made time for everybody. I mean, so if you see him and you say, hey, Dr. Randall, how you doing? He will stop what he's doing. He'll talk to you. He might have to go to the restroom, <laughs> but he will stop and talk. Okay. You know what I mean? And he would give you time and he would just impart his wisdom on you. And uh, he's just a good, great person. Nice. And so, uh, you know, that's what you that's that, that's what that's what you want to be as a leader. You want people to see you as a great person, as someone who's kind and gentle. Um, somebody that they're willing to follow, Okay. you know? But that's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you can lead people down the wrong path if you're not yes. careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that yeah. the being the head of a, of a household is, is like my new responsibility. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, I think if I think, if, uh, it definitely is very solemn. Yeah. You know, so, uh, which leads me into, I mean, that, that, that spirit, I'm, I'm gonna keep that in my mind because we're about to wrap this up, but, um, we're, we've made it to the present. You're here. You got a whole bunch of meet and greets going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Thursday you have something, correct? Uh, tomorrow night and Thursday night. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what was okay? So just real quick before we transition in, uh, do you, eh, no, I was going to say, oh, okay, I you, you can ask me what you want to. Okay, so okay. you never you never feel like uh, like when you're at the center of the, the attention, you ever uh, question how genuine people are? You ever feel like that? I do. You do. I do. What do? Okay. I do. Yeah. Pe pe people tell you who they are. And when people tell you who they are, I believe them. Okay. That's, that's the advice I give to you, especially as being the head of your household. When people show you who they are, believe them. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I think my, um, my mom did a very good job, you know, raising me uh, to good. be a good judge of character. And, yes. and keep, you know, you're, you're more blessed with a small circle sometimes, you know? And, <laughs> you said um, that twice. We had a, we had a 50, uh, our wedding was uh, 15 people. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, 50 people, sorry, 50, because yeah. of COVID and everything. And um, everyone who was there, I knew, you mm -hmm. know? And you know, some Mexicans, dude, we get some big freaking weddings. Yeah. And there's like people <laughs> you don't even know. Like you're, you're being introduced as the groom to people who are- At your like, wedding, you don't yeah, even know. You know yeah. Second plate, you know? Yeah. Uh, but um, no, like I, all 50 people, I, I like they felt the, the, either whether they were there for me or for my wife, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you keep that into that circle intimate, and um, it's beautiful, man. It's a good thing. So That's right. we talked about who you are. Mm -hmm. We talked about how you got here. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's wrap up with, with three quick questions, and then we're done. All right. Um, first question is this: uh, You know, this this podcast is going to be going out. Uh, people will be curious to see. You know, uh, who is Doctor Roosevelt, the unstoppable Doctor Roosevelt Nivens? <laughs> um, you're like we talked about, Doctor Randall. You're you're leaving some some big shoes. I mean, no, you're filling some big shoes. Yeah, he's leaving big shoes for you to fill. There you yeah. go. Um, you 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 have one of the fastest growing districts um, in the nation. In the nation mm -hmm. that you're inheriting. 
it's a lot of teachers, a lot of people who, who do this this job as their livelihood. If you could give a message to any teacher, any any anybody watching this right now who is a member of the LCISD family, um, a paid teacher, uh, custodian, mm -hmm. principal, um, what, what message would you, would you give to them right now? Oh, our number one purpose uh, is our kids. Okay. That's why we exist. As long as you're taking care of kids, we are good. I promise. Uh, but remember now, I was, that, I was that kid that needed it. And so there is a kid in our district, several in our district, that whose lives really literally depend on the teacher in that classroom and the principal in that building. That's the magnitude of the responsibility that we have. And I need people to understand that and feel that. Um, because it's isn't just a nine to five and you get your check. Uh, we get paid twice a month here, which is good. I didn't even know that. Um, <laughs> But you know, if you're depending on that, and as soon as the bell rings, you out the door, yeah. you, you, this is not your calling. I need people to, I need people that this is their calling. Because if it's your calling, you all in. And then when Johnny needs you or Sarah needs you, you're gonna be there for them. And then they'll end up being like a Roosevelt Nivens of the junior, right? Mm. Who easily, easily, man, could have been, I don't know, man, I don't know where I'll be. And God will never know. I don't know where I'll be. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank God. Uh, and I was in a household with two loving parents. And that's the power of a teacher. So I need teachers to understand how powerful they are, how important they are mm. in the lives of young people. Uh, and to pay attention to that. And don't let anything be too small that you ignore because uh, I'll never forget. I know, I know we got to go now. No, but go ahead, go ahead. I'm not going to kick the superintendent yeah. off my podcast right now. You <laughs> Where's your me? podcast? I mean, you know. And, uh, one thing you got to understand is to respect authority too, right? So uh, uh, I never forget though, man, I was an AP and yeah. I was walking into the building uh, from bus duty. All right. And I saw a young lady on the steps, a uh, young white lady uh, on the steps, just not crying, just, just looking like she was having a bad day. Yeah. And school had just started. Yeah. And so I walked by her and uh, my spirit just nudged me and said, she needs, she needs some help. So I had, a, I had a decision to make, you know, get in here and get to the cafeteria and make sure, you know, we're not fighting in the cafeteria <laughs> or, you know, see what this young lady needs. And so I had to say, you know, you all right? No, I'm good. I said, you don't look good. You straight. She said, eh, I'm all right. I said, well, come with me. This is illegal. <laughs> so don't do this. <laughs> I put her in my office and I prayed for her. Okay. I prayed for her. Uh, and that was it. Saw her, you know, rest of the school year, it was fine. And so, man, now, years later, I'm a principal. I was an AP then, I'm a principal in the same district. Mm. I win this award for the uh, National PTA, back then it was PTA, okay. Parent Teacher Association, principal of the year. We're in this restaurant. Mm. She is a server in this restaurant. Okay. She sees me, drops her tray, hugs me and says, me praying, she was considering committing suicide that day. Me praying for her led her to relationship. And that saved her life. I will never forget that, man. Um, one of my, uh, my good friends, uh, Dr. Uh, Salome Thomas L., he's, uh, he's written a few books. He, mm -hmm. One of his books is called The Immortality of Influence. Mm -hmm. And it's, I've always loved that that title because it, it really speaks to the uh, the nature of the of the impact that we can have on these kids. Yeah, and that, that's proof. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's. It's, it's serious, man. I need people to take it serious, man. This what we do is serious business. All right. Yeah, I'll okay. take it personal. Oh yeah, okay, good. So <laughs> I'll take it personal. Let's get yeah. more personal. So we 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 um I just you know I asked you to address uh, the people who are who you're going to be you know managing the teachers. Mm -hmm. I let, let's zoom in just a little bit more. Let's take it to that next level. Um, parents, send, people are sending their number one commodity. That's right. To these schools. That's right. Their children. Uh, there's parents who uh, who also notice the vacuum mm -hmm. of Dr. Thomas Randall and the impact this man has had. President of such and such and leader of whatever. You know. You know. The Walking on water. Yeah. Down down <laughs> down the street. Um, what would you say to to any parent watching this right now, to, um, who may you know who wants to know what the future is going to look like under 
under your leadership? Yeah. Uh, we gonna make we gonna take this district to new to new heights. I don't want to say anything that would ever take the shine off of Thomas Randall because he he deserves a whole lot more than that. Yeah. Um, but what I can tell parents is is that they are inheriting a guy who loves their kids. I want to say as much as they do because you don't understand love until you have your own kid. Take your word for it, man. You don't understand. It. I'm serious, man. Okay. When you have your own kid, you yeah, you don't understand love until you do have your own kid. Um, but I have my own children, and I know how I would want them to be treated and and respected and taught in school. Okay. And people send their kids to us, trusting us to make sure their kids are in a physically safe environment and an emotionally safe environment. Mm -hmm. And so no kid should ever go home um, with a story about how they were mistreated. Mm -hmm. And every kid should get home. No parent should ever get that call and say, I know your child came to school today, but they're not coming home. Gotcha. So safety is important to me yes, and instruction. Safety and instruction are top two priorities in the school district. Okay. Every kid that walks in our doors should come in, they should get home like they came, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Get home like they came, be safe, and then when we get them here, we take care of them and give them high quality instruction. Amen. Uh, and I, w I want parents to know that. I want y'all to hear that. That That's that's important. All right. You know, so uh, I've, I've buried kids at, in this role as a principal. I've buried, I, man, I've buried maybe one or two kids a year since I've been in education. Yeah. Well, I remember the first time uh, I got I got that email, you know, yeah. uh, about so-and-so or, or so, you know, and, and to hear how it happened. It, yeah. It, it's like. Nah, I can't be real. Like, yeah, I, I literally saw this kid. Yeah, it's tragic, man. You know, and it's tragic. Um, yeah, it, it leaves an impact on you. It, it does. It really does. It does. All right, so let's take the let's take the uh, the zoom in all, as far as it can go, man. Let's we start with the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, final question before we let you go. We start we start with the teachers. Mm -hmm. The people paid to be here and your expectations for them and and, and what you're about here and what you want. We uh, we zoomed in. We talked about the parents sending these kids the most. Precious commodity to LCISD, mm -hmm. um, and we comforted them, and we we talked about your vision for how you uh, the responsibility you take on mm -hmm. uh, for the, those kids and, and their safety. Uh, let's let's magnify it all the way down to the clients we serve, mm -hmm. these children. Um, they may not even never heard the the name Thomas Randall. You know what I'm saying? They, they, that is not the concern. Their concern is is coming these doors, eating this food. Mm -hmm taking this instruction, mm -hmm. having fun, and going home. That's mm -hmm. that's most times at it. That's right. But if you could, I, I do believe that your story and what you went through mm -hmm. um, and had to endure uh, when you were younger is unfortunately not a unique story. I agree. So what would you say to the student who's watching who, one, may feel like, education, the education system is not for them, it's failed them. Mm -hmm. um, but they've even taken it deeper. They began to internalize the way they, that, that the school system or school or people or teachers make them feel. Yeah. And it's become, it's began to touch their self-worth. If there's a student watching this, what, what message would you tell them? Um, <clears throat> I would say first is, it, it is what you make it. So when yeah. I was when I was struggling, when I was struggling, I was in my own self pity world, and rightfully so. Okay. Um, but it took someone to help me get out of that. And once I got out of that, it was what I made it. I could have stayed in that. She could have come to me and try to and help me as much as she wanted to, and I could have chosen to stay in that mode. But I chose not to. And so I would say to any of our students that are struggling, it is what you make it. And so you have to find an adult that's going to help you get out of that. And once you get out of it, don't go back to it. You have to, you have to make a conscious and intentional effort and decision to be the absolute best you can be. Because it, come, it starts with us. Yeah. No one can make you do what you don't want to do. I don't care what. I don't, I don't, care. I don't care what you say. If I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Okay. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And so 
our, our children are like that. And so they have to make sure that they make an intentional effort not to go back to that and be around the people that speak life to them. Don't be around the people that speak death. Hang around the people that speak life to you. Have your own aspirations, your own dreams, and go get it. Go get it. Because there's somebody that's here that's going to help you go get it. Yes. Go get it. I just, I, you know, it's funny, dude. I, you know, we're wrapping up. We got two more days left in the school year. And I, I literally just told my kids today, um, the final lesson I wanted to teach them was how to identify and how to separate people into two groups. And it's not off the basis of religion, um, race, sexual orientation, income. The, the way that you separate people and you begin to identify it, and I think it's a sign of maturity, is those who love you and those who don't, those who are for you and those who ain't. <laughs> and as long and, and the sooner you can start identifying that, the, the more time you can spend investing in the people who care mm-hmm. and, will, and, and, and attracting those people and, and you know, studying them, being around them, mm-hmm. and the less time you can spend pouring into those people and those friendships even, you know, that just detract from you. That are poisonous. Yep. So, um, yeah, yep. anybody out there young, uh, I, I think the man is very wise. And uh, parents, teachers, um, this is just one man's opinion. And you can watch the podcast and get your own. But I feel like we're in good hands. Thank you. All right. Thank so um, anything else you want to say for it before we wrap up? Uh, no, I do. And so I do end uh, messages and conversations by saying uh, I love you. Me too. All right, so let's go ahead. I don't have to know you, but I love you. All right, so this has been another episode of the Hype to Teach podcast, the podcast that goes beyond the classroom, beyond the lesson plans that focuses on the educators and the superintendents as people. I've been your host, Joel Nieto, the one and only Hype to Teach on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and every other social media platform that ever mattered. We are humble servants for you guys in LCISD. We're here to work, and um, that's it. Principal uh, Nivens, where can they find you on on, uh, on the you know social media? Um, at Dr. Dr. Underscore R Nivens. Okay. Uh, that's my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook is at Doc Nivens. D O C Nivens. All right, man. Well, it's been another episode of the Hyper Teach Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you've seen, please hit that like button, hit the share button, uh, tell your friends, tell your family. Uh, hide your kids, hide your wives. Tell I've you been Joe Nieto, yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for watching. We love you and bye. Love y'all. Peace out. Guys, thank you so much for watching and for more interviews that go beyond the classroom, subscribe to Hype to Teach on YouTube. And be sure to visit hypetoteach.com, your home for independent, teacher-led 